tester.co.uk Hello YouTubers and welcome to this little exercise where ultimately what we're going to do and the goal is to measure the capacitance value of a capacitor using an oscilloscope and a function generator. Now I must say I'm quite excited about this. It was something which came up ultimately when I first started reviewing LCR meters and I've only reviewed once. I, I did the review of uh, Frankie's LCR meter um, and in that I certainly hadn't had a lot of experience with LCR meters and ultimately from the readings that I was getting on that LCR meter I couldn't tell whether the meter was accurate or not or whether there were discrepancies with the capacitors with the capacitors that I was using and also the effect of frequency on the potential uh, readings from those capacitors and one of the suggestions at that point in time was to actually take an oscilloscope and measure a few capacitors on the oscilloscope and of course at the time I certainly didn't know how to do it I started looking into it but I never actually got around to performing that exercise in South Africa so I've gone and done it now and I must say I'm fairly excited about the end result Often when you're taking on a little exercise like this, uh, which involves some mathematics, some setting up an oscilloscope, a circuit, a signal generator, and hoping to achieve an end result which yields th the right numbers, it can be quite daunting. But it's happened, it's worked, and ultimately I want to show this so that I prepare myself for one, for the future electronics tutorial on capacitors, two, in preparation for future reviews of LCR meters. Now obviously the next one is the UT, UT612 and again so with this exercise now I can then go ahead with some confidence with certain capacitors and see whether this meter is yielding the right results. It also allows me to set up hopefully some capacitors that I can use as a standard, a transfer standard for future testing. As I said, I do hope to get uh, a nice, good, high-precision LCR meter, which will act as my reference on the bench. But that's only going to happen. I need to earn some more biscuit money, so hopefully uh, during the course of July, I'll be able to do that. Um, but before then, I thought this would be a great little exercise. Now then, to kind of, I want to again plant some seeds before we get onto the bench and actually look at the whole uh, setup for this practical. Um, I'm not going to say that everything I do is going to be exactly spot on or correct. Hopefully it will be. And this is certainly something that you can try at home. And don't be afraid of it failing or making mistakes. Because ultimately, once you pull it together and get there and understand what you're doing, I think there's a lot to be learned. I think it would be great seeing this video. But I think if you've got the opportunity to do your, this yourself, you will learn a lot through the whole exercise. So what we're going to do... In the, the basis for working out the value of the capacitor is understanding the RC time constant for that. So you've got a capacitor which is obviously something which can store energy or charge. When you put the charge into the capacitor, it takes a certain time to build that charge into the capacitor. And by measuring those properties, you can work out the value of the capacitor. Now in this exercise you're going to see we're going to have a circuit diagram which involves having a resistor and a capacitor. So we put the signal in through the resistor and then we measure the output on the scope of the capacitor. And I've seen, gone and followed some other videos on YouTube to kind of set this up myself and understand how it works. But in many of those videos, there are certain little bits of detail which wasn't explained. So I'm going to try and go through that now. Hopefully I get the fundamentals right. If not, it'll prepare me from the feedback for going into the tutorial. But so one of the things which I couldn't understand when I first looked at this exercise is, well, why do you need the resistor? before you go and uh, charge the capacitor. And my kind of understanding is that if you just applied a charge to the capacitor, it potentially is going to just fill up quickly. So if you envisage a bucket of water, 
Now let's say we want to understand the, capa the capacity of that bucket, which is what we want to do for the capacitor. If you simply got another bucket, bucket and dumped the water straight into that bucket, it's very difficult, to, if you're trying to measure the time it takes to fill up, it's very difficult to measure that time, if that's an important criteria for measuring the capacity, if you just dump it in straight away. So the rationale here is that, in essence, you have a hose pipe with a certain flow rate, and that's where the resistor comes into it. You're controlling the flow rate of the energy or the charge going into your bucket, the water coming into the bucket, so you can better meter it and thus work out the capacity. And that's where the resistor comes into this whole circuit as one of the important components. Because then that allows you to uh, more easily calculate because it's one of the fundamentals for this equation to work out the capacity of the capacitor. Then some of the other queries that were going through my mind were, well, what value resistor should I pick? And we obviously have a certain, we, the value of the capacitor might be unknown, as in our case it is, but I'm trying to verify or find the exact value of that capacitor. So that's not an issue, but how do you choose the value of the resistor? And when we get down and do the, t the actual calculation, we've got to take a point along the charge up curve, and that point happens to be 63.2%. Uh, Why? Why 63.2%? So when we get down to the bench, we're going to start going through those fundamentals. I'm going to show you a few bits and pieces that we need to obviously make this work and hopefully the end result will be good. Right, so let's get down to the bench. Right then, so let's just have a look at the various components on the bench to understand what's going to be involved in this whole exercise. So for one, I've obviously got my Agilent oscilloscope, which we're going to, is going to be displaying the end result. Now, I'm obviously using this because it's a nice scope, it's going to give a nice display, uh, and it should make life a bit easier in terms of doing the calculations. Can this be done on a cheaper entry-level scope? So at some point in time, either for the review of the Isotech uh, oscilloscope that I showed on a recent T4D, um, or in a T4D, I will do this exercise again to see whether it will be one of the tests to see whether an entry level scope can be used for an exercise like this and, and give reasonable results. The next thing is this from China I got this decade uh, resistance box. Do you need one of these for this exercise? No. I'm going to show you now I've got a box of um, off Amazon I've got a box of resistor values. You can go and get a normal resistor, plonk that onto a breadboard and just use that and that would be the normal way to do it. What this does allow me though is a little bit of functionality to vary the resistance, change the resistance to see how, how that reaction, what happens on the scope and see how that changes things. Then I've obviously got the next important thing is my function generator which I'm going to have a chosen frequency to actually do this exercise and we're going to be using a square wave and I'll explain why we, we will be using a square wave. Then just for interest, what I have also recently received is a set of uh, Kelvin clips, again, from, from China, I bought off eBay, uh, for use with my Fluke. But these allow me to measure resistance with a high degree of accuracy because it negates the losses in the actual cables themselves. And again, I'll do a separate video explaining how that works and demonstrating uh, the value of a set of Kelvin clips. But that's allowed me to at least check, let's say, to give me a good understanding that the values which I select on the decade resistor box over here are reasonably close to what they are stated as. Um, ultimately, when I go about setting up uh, reference resistors for myself, because this is where ball hairs do count, the finer detail does count, I'll probably be measuring the resistance right through the cables, right to where I'm working to account for all of that, to try and get as close as possible. Then obviously uh, we're going to be looking, having the piece of paper and I've got, we're going to do the calculations, a calculator. And I've got, again, because I bought off Amazon a nice array of capacitors, I've got some capacitors which we're using as a reference for this test. Now straight off I'll give you the values because ultimately that's what we're checking to see is if we get to the value. So I've got a bag here and the one in fact under test at the moment is a 47 nanofarad capacitor. We're going to repeat the test again 
with a 4.7 pico. So that should really change the results and here I'm literally going to redo this without prior testing to see if that actually does work and whether we can get a result. So at least we can see we've got repeatability in the test itself. So let's go and have a look at the theory quickly and then we'll set up for the actual test. Right, so let's kind of look at the kind of practical setup and the theory behind what we're trying to achieve. And as I said here, that for me this is a dry run in preparation for uh, future tests and the tutorial. So certainly if there are any mistakes or what have you, let's have a chat about it in the comments so I can pick up on it and make sure I get it right for the final tutorial. So this is the circuit which we're going to be using to find out what the value is or test for the value of this capacitor over here. I, over here you can see I've noted that I'm using a 1K or 1000 ohm resistor in the circuit. You can use another value, that doesn't matter because ultimately you just need to place that value into the equation. But sometimes if you are kind of working with a particular circuit and trying to work out a time function, well then you, you're going to be selecting certain values or working with a predetermined value. I've chosen this and I'll show you on the scope that by varying the value you can get a kind of cleaner or nicer output from your uh, waveform that comes out of the capacitor depending on that value. So I've gone and selected the 1K literally because of that and I'll demonstrate that on the scope. We have a signal coming in, a square wave. Why a square wave and not let's say a sine wave? Well ultimately one of the important criteria in this equation is time and what we're trying to do is put a constant charge up on the capacitor to see to work out its capacitance and a square wave has got that constant on and then it goes off and a sine wave it's varying it's building up so it's not constantly on and then it's going down at a different rate so that's why we want a nice clean sharp edge square wave for this exercise so what we're expecting to see out the other side then is a wave something like this and if you un understand if we're putting in a square wave the capacitor is going to start charging up building up the voltage in it and then it's going to reach its, its voltage level for what you're putting in and again so that's something which you can obviously vary for this exercise I'm using a 1 volt peak to peak voltage you can obviously use different voltages um, what you obviously need to bear in mind is that you don't want to exceed the rating of the actual capacitor itself but the voltage level per se doesn't play a part in the equation so that's not too much of a problem. Also I've noted that on the LCR meters that test capacitors they work from kind of 0.1, 0.2 volts up to 1, up to 2 volts so that's kind of why I'm playing in this area as well. So obviously on the output we get this nice curve as the capacitor charges up it's then charged and then when the wave comes down the capacitor discharges fairly quickly and it repeats the cycle again. And the important part that we're looking for is we know the resistance part because it's predetermined in the circuit. We, we don't have the capacitance that's what we're looking for so this the equation which defines us is T is equal to RC and if we're looking for C, therefore C is going to be equal to T divided by R. So we need, the missing component for us is the T, is the time. And that's the time to charge a capacitor. And if I just take a rough dotted line down here, if we looked at those dots I put over there, you can see that they right at the bottom when the charge starts and goes right to the top. Now is that the, the correct time period that we need to measure from right at the bottom to the top? No, believe it or not. What we need to do is measure at up at when the, the level reaches 62.3%. 62.3% of that level from here to there. If you don't start off obviously at zero, which is where we are going to be starting off, you, it's the 62.3% of the difference but in our case because we're starting off at a baseline of zero it's 62.3% is the level 
you're going to measure to. So up at that point, that's where you're going to, going to take your line and then that becomes your time measurement that you're looking for, your T. The 62.3% basically comes from the constant E. Now, again, my mathematics is not my strong point, but I do enjoy applied maths. I'm going to put a link below where you can go and read um, a wiki article about the constant E. It occurs naturally and it also describes the curve of a, in a, uh, an exponential equation. So I don't want to go into too much detail here because I don't have the wisdom to explain it to you. But it's something I, I at least have, rather than just having this figure bandied about, that is where it's derived from. And certainly do some more reading to find out about that. So that's what we're doing to set this up. I'm going to show you the bits and pieces now and then we'll actually put it on the scope and see how well it works. Right, so let me again just pre-show you the bits and pieces so that you know what I'm going to be fiddling with as I kind of make the adjustments on the scope. So I've got that uh, capacitor, as I said, the capacitor down there is from this bag. So it is a 47 nanofarad capacitor. So we know that up front and it is sitting down there. And I've got the function generator connected across it or through uh, with a the resistor, the decade resistor boxes in the circuit as well. It's back here. And then I've got the oscilloscope measuring the output. On the actual function generator itself, if we go in and have a closer look, you can see I've got it set to uh, 1000 hertz or 1 kilohertz and then at a amplitude of 1 volt peak to peak. So, we're all set to go. I'm going to line you up on the oscilloscope switch things on and then start making adjustments for the resistance. Right, so we're ready to go. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch on my function generator so we get an output. Bang. Now I've gone and preset obviously the adjustments for the volts per division um, and the time base just so that we get a nice signal in screen. As I said, if that's something you want to see then certainly I've got a tutorial on oscilloscopes which I'm continuing which you can obviously go and watch and see how that's done. But I've gone and set it, set it up so we've got a, a nice signal in the display. Now as you can see that signal that's coming in there that looks very square in comparison to what we we're kind of looking for as a kind of classic uh, charge and discharge of the capacitor. Now why is that? That's because at the moment on the decade resistor box, I've got no resistance dialed in. So literally that's just like having the bucket and chucking a whole lot of water in at once uh, to, to fill it up and then tipping it out. And as you can see, it then doesn't, it doesn't make it easy to give us that time curve that we're looking for so that we can easily do the calculation. And that's where you kind of want to dial in that resistance so that you slow the rate at which the capacitor is charging to get a nice curve so that you can do the calculation. So that's the beauty of this box. I can like dial in, I've got like 0.1 ohm, 1 ohm. I'll start dialing in literally I'm dialing up to 9 ohms, you can't see much. If I start going on the 10 ohm scale, so I've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. If you look really closely, if I switch between 0 and 90 ohm, you can actually see a difference in the waveform there. You can actually see there's some time being taken to actually charge the capacitor. But of course that's, that's not a lot. So we can, I'm then going to go up to 100, so I've got 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900 ohm. Now we seem to be getting a nice profile on the output signal where we can start taking measurements on the actual charge, charge scope. So for simplicity what I decided to do, that's at 900 ohm, I then went straight to 1000 ohm just for a round figure so I mean you could change this I mean that's 2000 but the the wave there is perhaps getting a little bit distorted we haven't got the nice clean you could probably still use it but you haven't got the nice clean peak at the top to show that the capacitor has actually kind of reached its charge of what you what you're putting into it so that's how I came about using the 1000 ohm right so the next part of the exercise is 
um, now lining up and doing the measurement on the screen. Right, so now we get down to the measurement side of things and ultimately what I do for me to work out that period where I can actually take the measurement, remember I said we need to work out the 63.2%. Now to do that, I ultimately need to know what the amplitude is of the wave and that was an, another reason or a handy reason for having a round figure of let's say that one volt peak to peak. So let's now go and switch on the cursors and I'm going to have to do a little bit of fiddling here to go and measure that. So at the moment I'm uh, changing the kind of X uh, cursor and I want to be changing the Y so that we can go and get that amplitude so right. So what we're doing, I've got the bottom cursor, I'm adjusting that to the bottom of the wave. I'm now going to, that was Y1, now Y2 we're going to take and that we now got the measurement for the top of the wave and if you look very closely over here it gives you the delta, the difference between the two and again without splitting too many ball hairs for this exercise but I said for me later on even these smaller figures are going to be important you can see it's noted at 1 volt just over 1 volt so 1.01325 volts as a matter of fact peak to peak voltage so that gives us a nice clear indication so what I'm going to do to make to get that figure then because it's now a straightforward it's 1 volt I have to move down to about 63, 632 millivolts. So let's bring it down, bring it down. 63, okay, so I can only go to 632.5, but that's fine because a 632, so that is 63.2% of the total. So that makes getting that calculation easier. So that gives me the point on the wave here according to that uh, constant that you've got to me measure to. So you're going to mention your, measure your time period up to that point to get your time. So now we're going to start fiddling around on the time axis. So again we go and what we need to measure is to go and change the X. We'll do X1 and I'm placing that right at the foot of the wave. Okay, and I'm obviously only using my eyes. I could zoom in if I really wanted to get it there, but it's fine. I'm quite happy I've, I've got it there. Now I'm going to select uh, the X2. So that's our second cursor. And I'm going to take it up there where it intersects with the wave, right over there. So let's have a look. And I think I've got it on. And look, so now we've now got the delta x, and that delta x is the ch is the difference between the two cursors over there, and that figure is 50 microseconds. So now we've got all our figures. So just note that 50 microseconds, relatively straightforward to set. Well, I say straightforward to set up. It's it's good to have an understanding of where and why you're making those adjustments. But now we can go down to the paper and see wh what that brings us. Right here, so down to the theory and see if it actually matches up with the practical. So we've got C, our capacitance is equal to T time over R resistance. So if we go and put in our values now, so I said it was 50 microseconds. So what is that? That is zero. Let's double check I get it right. So the, if we go three zeros, that would be milli. If I went down to another three, we'd be down to micro. We've got 50 microseconds, so that's going to be five zero. So let's check. Down to here is obviously we've got milli down to three places. Down to six places is going to be uh, micro. So we've got 50 microseconds. Right and that is going to be divided by uh, our resistance. And we know our resistance. It's a known value. Remember it's 1k or a thousand ohm. And we measure and we obviously working in ohms. So that's over 1000. And let's get the calculation and do that. Right, so I've got the calculator out. I'm just holding it up at funky angle just so I get the light uh, right. So we've got 0 0.12345 for fun. I'll put the last zero on, but obviously it's not required. 
and I could either say divide by but because I've got this nice calculator I'm going to say over 1, 1, 2, 3, 1000 okay and if we go equals on that we get that kind of representation I can change it and that is saying how many zeros? 0 0.0000005 so let's just write that down Zero point one two three four five six seven and then a five. Double check that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a five. So what's that equal to? Well, if we put little commas in for our so that's gonna be um, and if we had a, added a zero there, because that would be, a, just to kind of get it right, we'd be down to uh, milli, micro, nano. Okay, so that is 50 nanofarad. Let's have a look at the packet. Our packet of capacitors says 47 nanofarad. So look at that. It looks as though it's all worked out. So there's obviously a certain tolerance on the capacitors themselves um, but that one seems to be spot on 50 narrowfarad and there you go it says I'll dare I say as simple as that to actually use the oscilloscope and a function generator to work out the value of a capacitor now potentially what could change this is obviously certain capacitors will uh, with the frequency are going to change in value so what we're going to do again I'm going to repeat this whole exercise with the I said, as I said we would with a 4.7 picofarad capacitor I've not done this so things may come undone we're going to do it with this uh, capacitor and I'm going to change the frequency so I'm going to change the frequency we'll play around with the resistance to make sure we get a nice shape just to see how whether things work out the same and just before we do that, I just want to note, although I did it correctly on the oscilloscope, I put down the figure here of 62.3% on this diagram. That was wrong. It should be 63.2. So that is wrong. So just to note that, I transposed the uh, 2 and the 3. So it should be 63.2 uh, percent of up your uh, charge cycle over here is where you take your measurement. I did it correctly on the scope so that's why fortunately the calculation wasn't uh, incorrect but anyway let's move on to the next one. Right so I've got the uh, 4.7 picofarad uh, capacitor sat in there I've got obviously the both the scope and the uh, function generator connected I've got the decade resistor box on the side here I'm going to start off by using the same frequency as I did before a square wave one volt peak to peak at one kilohertz and let's see what result we get on the screen so I'm going to line up and then switch on right so I've got the oscilloscope on I've just switched on the function generator oops and what's that it looks like we've got some artifacts on the square wave but let's just work with it for now um, I'm going to dial in the 1000 ohm and we can't see any change in the kind of leading edge to that. I'm going to dial in, let's go to, the, let's, I've got right at the top end 90, 90k if I, if it's, if I'm reading correctly, yep. And it's having some effect, but not, okay, and so this does make sense I've got a lot smaller capacitor so it's like having a very small bucket so it's gonna fill up very quickly so I really need to reduce the rate of energy being put into that bucket if I'm gonna get a reasonable curve and my decade resistor box doesn't have enough resistance to do that so what I'm gonna do I've got let me just pull out and again, I must say, this is really handy. You get, oh, I've got this on my Amazon store, Joe, Joe Knows Electronics. Well, just go and look it up wherever you buy your electronics. 
certainly very handy. You get a whole box full of a range of um, resistor values and it's the same for capacitors. So I'm going to be using that to pull out a bigger resistor. I'm going to fiddle around and get one until I find one that gives us a charge curve. I'm reconnected in conjunction with my, my decade resistor box so I can at least play with it. But I want to get to the point where at least I've got that nice charge up curve. Right, so as I said, you're coming along with on the ride with me. So a couple of challenges. What I've done, um, if you can see from this wonderful noisy signal on my scope, there does seem to be a now a nice curve profile, but there's a lot of noise and bobbling around there. How I've achieved that, I just took a chance and I pulled out a one meg resistor and I've simply tapped that onto the end of my decade resistor box. Uh, and that seems to be something, as I said, which is giving us that curve, but the signal is noisy. Why is it noisy? I'm not 100% sure. It could be picking up uh, from the fluorescent lighting in the lab. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pull in and try and bring in some noise rejection. The problem is also with this wave, because it's so noisy, the triggering will be a bit of a challenge because the edge is so, uh, it's so it's such a noisy edge. So I'm going to try to change the uh, triggering time. Okay, that seems to be helping. Let's just see if I really slow things down. This is going to obviously complicate life in terms of getting a steady wave to take a reading. But let's work with it. Let's work with it. I'm going to stop that. And oh, it's ugly isn't it? I don't know if I can, let me just see if I can do any better. I don't think I can. Let's just see that if we work with that, scale it up and then that'll make it easier as opposed to having a smaller signal and working to small noise, if I'm working off that, that should make life easier. So I've, in essence what I've done, I've zoomed, I've obviously slowed it down, I've zoomed in to work with what I've got. I'm sure there'll be people shouting and say, well there's this and that you could do. But I've worked with the controls that I know about and let's just see, let's just see where we get to. So let's just pull in the cursors and what we're going to do again, we'll work with the um, First of all, we want to actually work, get the actual height of the wave. So let's work with, we need to work with Y1. So I'm obviously again measuring the height of the wave to get to that 63.2%. Uh, let's just make sure, yeah, 63.2% is what we're looking for. So I've got the bottom of the wave. Um, we now want to go for Y2 top of the wave, measure to the top of the noise. Let's just see, okay, so that's giving us a signal of 978 millivolts, which is less than the, obviously because of the noise and what have you, it's not quite our one volt peak to peak, but again, let's just stick with it and see how we go. Uh, let's go with now X1. being silly. X1 at the start of the wave over there is where I'm taking it. I can see you're going to incur a little bit of error here. Nonetheless, and let's go to X2. And X2, uh, what we're looking for, oh silly boy, to get it I've got to bring down the Y. Where's Y1? It is Y1, isn't it? No, shows you how often I drive a scope. Got to go to Y2. Okay, and what are we looking for now? We've got to get to... Let's do the... I'm going to have to use the calculator now if I want to make... Let's call that 978. I'm quickly going to get the calculator and work out the, the percentage on that. Right, so let me just show you. I've just got the calculator. I've, so I've taken the total value of that of the wave the 978 times the 63.2 percent and that call, we'll call it splitting the odd ball here is 618 
so let's see if I get this correct now so I've got to come down to a figure of and I'm looking at the delta figure over here 618 okay and it goes 618.75 I'm gonna have to go to 617 okay right so that is the level now I can adjust the other cursor x1 not x1 silly boy x2 crosses about there by all accounts okay let's just check yeah say about there okay and the delta there so the time calculation we've got is 60 microseconds so let's go down to the bench and see if we get any reasonable calculation out of that right so let's see if we get anywhere with this I say it's going to be interesting to see with those challenges whether we get a meaningful result from this so capacitance of C equals time over resistance and our time for that we said was 60 microseconds so that's going to be equal to 0 0.000060 and again just to point out that would be milli we get down to micro and we've got 60 over now although I've got a 1 meg resistor in there I have noted on the um, decade resistor I did happen to have uh, 1k dialed in as well so that is going to be one zero zero one zero 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 so basically one million one thousand ohm okay so let's get the calculator and see what that comes to so zero point one two three four six over one zero zero one zero 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 we got that right four yes and let's go equals okay and that's five point nine nine I'm gonna take it to the minus eleven so I'm gonna jot that down on the paper so it's more of a meaningful uh, reading for us Right, so that turns out to be um, 59.9 picofarad, which is definitely wrong because, you know, had it been, and I've double checked myself, obviously to the minus 11, so minus 12, we now would be talking pico, and it's an order of magnitude out. Had it been 5.9 pico, then I would have said, okay, down to the courses of the calculation, what have you, uh, that would be in the realms of uh, the 4.7. But it's not. It's an order of magnitude out. So where have I gone wrong? So I'm going to go away quickly and fiddle and change frequency and mess around and see if I can resolve this because I cannot see from here where I've gone wrong right so for the life of me I cannot figure out where I've gone wrong it's probably something really simple and I'm looking at this and I'm not finding it I think there's perhaps a couple of issues that are coming into play here once you certainly uh, going down to uh, this level of small capacitance uh, and setting up on the scope I think perhaps I'm obviously entering a level where uh, it's very difficult to measure that because you of the range you're working at and the potential noise I'm guessing here open for debate so I'm going to retry the exercise I'm going to go further as opposed to going down from where I was with a 47 nano I'm going to go up so I've grabbed a 0.22 microfarad capacitor I'm going to set that up I'm again I'm going to do it at a, at a different frequency I'm going to choose this time to do it about 100 Hertz uh, we'll work out again what the, the ideal resistance is and then we'll do the calculations on that and see if we come right right so just to show you where we are I've got the function generator set up for this time a hundred Hertz so again we're trying this whole exercise uh, at a different frequency 
and I've got the uh, point, what was it again, 0.22 microfarad capacitor is set up over there and on, I've got the scope ready so I'm going to line you up on the scope and I'm going to switch it on and we'll start doing the measurements. Right, I've got the camera ready, I'm going to switch on the function generator bang and there we go we've got our square wave coming out at 100 Hertz and it should be at still at the 1 volt peak to peak so what we got at the moment we obviously cannot see any um, of that nice charge I'm going to try and get one wave in there so what we're looking for again is that nice charge curve that we can actually measure so I'm going to start dialing in okay so I'm starting let's go for obviously 10 ohm okay and if you look carefully you can see that does is doing something I'm gonna go for the times 100 so we've got a hundred two three four and we certainly starting to get and we okay so let's go to 1k and there we go I kind of like the shape again at 1k so I'm gonna use that let's just make it go in a little bit closer so that we kind of get a nice area to actually measure so I'm going to start putting the cursors in on that by bringing the cursors uh, what do we want to we want to set the height get the amplitude of the wave first so that I can obviously set the 63.2 percent level so where is Y1 should be at the bottom let's check we've got it at the bottom and there again as you can see so I've got that that delta of about one one volt peak to peaks so that's great that makes it easy for me so now I have to go back to uh, Y2 and bring it down again we're looking at the delta down to 63 point two oh there we go spot on okay so I've got that as a, a nice measurement and now we're going to change the x1 and x2 let's see where we are put the x1 right at the beginning of the uh, curve down there let's go to x2 uh, here we are and that we want exactly on that point over there basically bang so that looks about right if we zoom in yes the crosshairs seem to be in a good position so that is 220 microseconds right so we've got that reading we know what the resistance is let's get back down to the paper again right here so we onto the paper we in time I said just looking at the scope 220 microseconds so at 0 0.000 two two zero because obviously we've got uh, milli down to micro so that's 220 and then that has got to be divided by and we were back to the same 1000 1 1k ohms and let's get that onto the calculator so here we go 0 0.000220 and this time we'll just go be simple and divide by one, one, two, three equals, and that is zero point how many six zeros six two 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 is that right? Have I counted correctly? So that's milli mic micro ah so that's correct. That gives us our spot on 0 0.22 microfarad so if we had to bring the comma right down we obviously uh, come down to there to get to micro and that would be 0 0.22 microfarad okay so that worked out so let's uh, sum that up right then so I hope you found that exercise of value and um, I'm still stumped as to why the why I couldn't get the the middle one right with a very small capacitor value um, I'm sure someone's gonna jump in and say it's that and I'm gonna kick myself but I think it's a good thing to see where it goes wrong as well there's a couple of reasons 
when when someone first said to me you can go measure the capacitor of a or measure the value of a capacitor on an oscilloscope using a function generator I immediately, I immediately felt a little bit intimidated about going through that exercise myself. And as you can see, I've gone through it. It's very doable. You can make mistakes and things might not work out, but try it again until you get it right. Change the frequency, the resistance values, the capacity you're measuring. Try and get another one to try and make it easy for yourself and you can see what the end result can be. So I'm really chuffed at the end of the day what can be achieved by that. I plan to use that method to perhaps measure out uh, very accurately, noting using the Kelvin clips to measure out the exact resistance, um, getting very zoomed in very closely in the scope to make sure I get the measurement points exactly in the right place, and try and set up a few reference capacitors if I can, and then correlate that to proper measurement devices, LCR meters, to see a precise one, so we can do a comparison of what a scope can do versus a precise LCR meter, and then that gives us a good reference point for doing the cheaper LCR meters. But anyway, I wait for your comments. Hopefully it's been of value, but I'll catch you soon for the next video. Cheers. Tester.co.uk